and welcome for those of you that are from the outside of the London School of Economics and for those of you that are part of it, welcome again. Um, this evening we are uh, celebrating this book, Urban Regeneration and Social Sustainability. Um, it raises many, many interesting issues, probably as good books should, as many questions as it answers, and we're going to try and leave a lot of time uh, for questions and discussions after the speakers. But we do have four very important presenters. Andrea Colantonio here on my right, who works with us in the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion, but is also, and is actually, employed by LSU Cities, his main base. Uh, Tim Dixon from Oxford Brooks, a professor of real estate and director of sustainable development who was the inspiration and um, organizer, I think, uh, behind this work. Uh, Brian Field, who is from the European Investment Bank, who from that side, the funding side, but also the investment side, the really big take on these uh, issues um, was a driving force and an amazing colleague and ally I hear, so thank you for coming <coughs> to respond. And Jan Olbrecht, um, who is Member of Parliament for the European Parliament and also Chairman of the uh, Urban Parliamentary Group. So we'll get um, an academic perspective, an investment perspective and a political perspective before you all have your say. So without more ado, I'll ask Andrea to come and start us off on this journey. Thank for coming this evening. Thank you for your introduction. I'm, um, we're here to <coughs> mark the launch of this book, um, which uh, I call the Lipkin Dixon. And um, the book draws upon a, a research study which was funded by the European Investment Bank uh, between 2006 and 2009. And um, it was a three year research project um, entitled Examining Best Practices. <coughs> to measure and monitor socially sustainable urban regeneration. So we're grateful to the European Investment Bank for allowing us to carry out this project. So why is social, social sustainability important? Well, it is important because you could argue that it's the least studied and often overlooked dimension of sustainable development. Um, if we step back and we look at the, the sustainable development debate, there can be little doubt that the environment dominated the debate uh, from the mid, from the late 1980s to the mid 1990s, and economic and social issues were not uh, well understood or well well studied in this phase of the debate. From the mid 1990s to the mid 2000s, um, economic issues um, gained more prominence within the debate, and also the <coughs> the governance together with the governance. Uh, the social issues, though, the social dimension was still there on one side, not properly understood or, or examined. Um, I think, I think uh, well, I, I feel that by the mid-2000s, um, until the late 2000s, we really struck a balance between all these four dimensions. Um, you know, the governance, uh, environmental, social, economic, uh, the key word was integrated approach to regeneration to, to, to promote sustainable development. However, the crisis uh, hit a lot of uh, economies uh, in 2008, and I think now the, the whole economies, economic issues are trimming the, the policy agenda once again. So what is social sustainability? That's a one million dollar question. Um, there are different views and different uh, arguments about it. Uh, the first one is that it's a, it's a precondition for sustainable development. It's something you need to have before you achieve sustainable development. Um, it's a requirement that you can have in, in communities, so you can achieve, you can go on and achieve sustainable development. Other people actually argue that it's actually the finality of development. It's not something that's before sustainable development, but it's actually the goal of sustainable development. Um, and similarly, there's another um, disagreement on whether, whether it is an end state. Uh, it is something that uh, is an outcome um, that you can, you can say, you know, this 
communities is socially sustainable or is it not? Or is it more about the process? Is, is it more about how you do things which are more socially sustainable? And the answer to all these questions is that, as I mentioned to you, there's, there's no general agreement um, on whether it's a cause and effect or it's an outcome or a process. Um, and I think to me it's a bit of um, all of these issues depends on, on uh, which kind of context you're, you're working in. So for the purpose of our work, we come up with this definition um, about social sustainability, working definition. Essentially, social sustainability is about people. We, we often forget this. You know, people is the starting point of any um, you know, human actions, uh, including economic action and environmental action. So it's about how individuals, groups and community, gather together and, and decide what they want from, for themselves. Uh, what kind of development uh, models they want, um, but taking into account the, you know, the, the physical boundaries, the, the environmental limits of their place, and also the, uh, the planet as a whole. I know this is sort of a very generic definition, probably too broad, but um, allow it has to tailor this definition to different contexts and different disciplines. And you know, most of you will be social scientists here, you know that we disagree on most everything. So I think providing a, broad, um, uh, a good uh, broad definition can allow us to a certain flexibility on, on, on adapting to different contexts. So how do you op operationalize social sustainability? Um, I did, Tim and I did literature review and looked at uh, what other people um, wrote before us, we looked at you know, the policy debates, we looked at um, uh, newspapers or all those different sources and I think we came up with um, this suggestion that there is a set of traditional key themes and domains at the, at the heart of the notion of social sustainability. These are hard themes, these are traditional themes which have been in the debate since its beginning, since the early 1990s. So this is um, the, the debate about housing, education, equity, employment. But in parallel to this uh, set of traditional uh, domains and themes, there are a set of emerging themes which are much more intangible, much more difficult to, uh, to measure and also to act upon as, you know, as from a policymaker perspective. Um, for example, it's difficult to, to justify a nappiness-based policy. You could, uh, you could try to do it, but you know, in terms of then defining happiness um, and also measuring the effect of your policy, I mean, it, it's, it's a, such a complex issue. But we, anyway, we, we, we feel that for a community to be social, socially sustainable, you need to take into account all these issues all together. I know it's a, it's a difficult task, but um, I actually started with 30 something themes and domains, but I have to com, you know, um, aggregate them <coughs> in broader categories. And also, social sustainability relates to different, um, to different um, spatial and functional levels. You know, we can talk about so social sustainability of households, of community cities, uh, regions, and, and the world as a whole. And the themes I've just showed to you, they apply to um, the dis different uh, spatial and functional level in different ways. For example, at household level, the importance of social capital is minimal. By contrast, the importance of um, crime, uh, sorry, um, uh, domestic violence is probably more important. If you look at international level, uh, I think it's more important the issue of um, inequalities rather than sense of place. So you need to really uh, play around with the themes and the areas to operationalize the, the, what social uh, sustainability is. And in the book, we looked at uh, five different case studies of cities, uh, how they regenerate, how they implemented regeneration projects. Um, we selected them using a wide range of criteria, ranging from governance, uh, size, uh, development stage, typology. We wanted to look at projects which were, were fully public to projects which also included a public-private partnership, uh, small projects versus you know, city-wide projects, and, and so on. And we came up with this, uh, uh, you know, we decided to investigate uh, these five cities. The next one is coming in the next slide. So the first one is La Mina. It's about a neighborhood, uh, a peripheral neighborhood um, in the outskirts of Barcelona, 
which uh, was built to rehouse a Roma community uh, in the 1960s by Franco. Um, and it, you know, since then has been a very closed community, um, plagued with a lot of crime, um, drugs, and, and usual problems which social communities which, which have multiple deprivations um, have. The second project um, we selected is Road Basin in Cardiff, which is part of um, Cardiff uh, Bay. We selected this project because um, at the time he hadn't started yet, actually it was a brownfield, I think it's still a brownfield, but we wanted to understand how social sustainability was included uh, in urban development project at the planning stages. So how do you plan uh, communities looking for, for the social aspects uh, at the planning stages, uh, not just when the project has started, but also um, before it starts. Uh, I'll come back to all these case studies in a bit more depth. Uh, the third case studies, which is in the book, is uh, South Park in Rotterdam. As you can see, sorry, the, the purple, the highlighted area indicates the, the area which has been regenerated. And the South Park is a citywide uh, project um, involving 1 billion euros. It's a massive investment in South Rotterdam uh, involving five sub municipalities and five housing corporations. It's very much integrated, it's very much um, multi dimensional. Um, but again, it's a very large, large scale project running between 2005 and 2015. The fourth, pro the third, the fourth um, city we looked at is Turin, Porta Palazzo. It's a, it's a neighborhood, in an, it's an inner city uh, area neighborhood, which whose uh, was, was main f feature is actually a, a market, uh, which attract a flea market, which attract a lot of uh, informal <coughs> vendors, a um, lot of, um, let's say, legal immigrants who just come you know, to, to work for the day. It's a really problematic um, area. The fifth city we, we looked at in the book is Leipzig. Apologies for the different type of map. Um, but again, it's Leipzig is you know, the former East German uh, city with massive uh, gap in uh, infrastructure investment for, you know, for fifth, fifth, um, 40 years and lots of uh, housing stocks crumbling. So I'm not going to talk about in depth about all these case studies, but I will provide just an overview of, what, of the things we liked in, um, in each, case, in each uh, city and why we selected them. I think in Rotterdam we particularly liked the, the, the way they were monitoring um, the, the regeneration project. They came up with this index, the Sociale Index, which is an index, is an aggregate index, which combines together different dimensions, um, you know, to, literally to measure the quality of places, to measure the, the evolution of, of, um, of the place. And you can see how these dimensions range from hard things, like, again, like income, education, health, to more uh, softer things, like uh, you know, social interaction, participation, capacities, and you know the, the index work is a you know according to a traffic light system. For example, in this community, the real problem is the income, uh, which is in, in, in red. Um, and this index uh, is used to both monitor the the, um, the impact of of the generation project, but also to inform what uh, which aspects um, the policy should focus on. And in this case, once again, is uh, income, for example, you know, to less extent language. I mean, in South, um, in South Rotterdam, for example, there's so many different people from different ethnic backgrounds, and they don't speak Dutch. So they really try to measure how many people manage to improve the, the language skill. It's actually a barrier. There. So uh, I think we like the fact that it's a very comprehensive, very multi-dimensional um, index, which can inform policy. In Turin, we like the participation and empowerment in Porta Palazzo, uh, the regeneration project. You can see here in the picture is one of these workshops in which uh, actually two city, two former city mayors are in the in um, in the picture. And you know, one key aspect of the, of the project was to give visibility to institution. They actually opened up an office in the square which was being regenerated because they didn't really need to win the residents' trust. Let's not forget that neighborhood with multiple deprivation residents don't you know that don't 
um, particularly consider institutions as their, their friends, actually they see them as a threat, um, you know, social services. So it's important then, you know, to give this visibility of institutions and to win the, the local residents' trust, trust. Once again, trust is one of these uh, softer themes which are emerging in the debate. We also liked the, the fact that um, they promoted a lot of social enterprises, small scale um, project. And I would like to mention here the key role of the bank foundations. I'll come back to this at the end of this presentation. But the bank foundation, the third sector, the, you know, the cooperative sector, that became key players in urban regeneration um, across Europe, um, to a certain extent following the US model. So you know, the, we need to, I think it's important to take them into account. In terms of Lamina, uh, the, the main action there was to increase the permeability of the neighborhood, allow people to literally uh, cross this neighborhood, people from outside. Just the, the, main, ob object, the main objective was to open up this neighborhood, um, which again is 100% social housing, let's not forget this. Um, and also another crucial, um, crucial uh, objective was to increase, to improve the image of, of this place. The local authorities began to work with local newspapers, um, you know, to, to ask them to publicize when positive changes were happening in the neighborhood. And it's really important. I mean, so far, this neighborhood, you can see how the state of some of this, um, uh, the housing, I mean, it's been featured in several Gangster movies. So, you know, if you watch a movie, you see Lamina. You know, in the in the collective um, perception, you don't really think that it's a nice neighborhood to live. So, so the, one of the key aspects was to change this image. And again, its perception of place is, is crucial to for social sustainability. It's the same um, level as to improve um, the, the the public spaces. People need to feel attached to that place. People need to collect rubbish if it's unpaid. So it's really important that, uh, it was really important for this project that um, the local community took um, charge and responsibility for their local environment. In Cardiff, once again, this is the picture <coughs> that shows to you uh, the condition of, of, the, of the, the site. Uh, this was in 2008, it might have uh, changed, it was actually close to, to the site, which is, 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 a, is a large, Brownfield, 38 acres, uh, acres sorry, um, the plan to develop uh, 1,000 new houses, um, 4,000 jobs, a new BPC center is, is going to be based here. And we really like the partnership between, uh, the public-private partnership between the public, uh, sorry, the Welsh authorities and Igloo Regeneration. Um, we particularly like the, the, the footprint regeneration framework that Igloo which is a, once again a public-private um, partnership, um, is implementing. I think Tim is going to mention something about Igloo, um, and I also see people from Igloo itself in the, in the room. Um, in Leipzig, we really liked the, the fact that uh, the social um, um, uh, the social programs were part of a national program, the Social Start uh, program, and it was interesting to see the vertical integration of um, of uh, governments, you know, the city, the regional, and the national, but also the horizontal integration. In, um, uh, integration. The Ministry of Transport worked together with the Ministry of Housing, and this is a sort of requirement that you know the both the, the German government and the EU has uh, asked for. We also we like the fact that they were thinking ahead. They were thinking about what happened after the regeneration scheme finished, when the funding finished. They started beginning setting up um, management management structure to look after these places. Like they built a few uh, local community centres. They built, uh, they set up a management council to look after these centres once the, f the, the 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 funding was was over. So um, once we've done all the, the empirical work in the book. Um, I, we can say that we learned a lot about the practice of social sustainability. We learned a lot about the key themes and the key domains which are involved, uh, in which the, you know the, the concept is, is is embedded in. So we went back to our drawing boards and we linked it, the practice, what we learned in the practice, 
to the theory of social sustainability, there are different theoretical approaches. Um, I mentioned a few here. I'm not going to discuss this in 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 in, in, uh, in depth, but you know, it's, all, it's all in the book. Um, so you know, we come out. One of the main output of of our research was to create this uh, this social sustainability assessment framework, uh, which again links the theory, uh, you know, the, the work that we do in, in uh, academia, to the policy, the principles which you know, underpin all these social socially oriented policies. Um, and you know, in the book, there is also uh, toolkits for assessment uh, of uh, good practices, uh, select a selection of uh, checklists and indicators, uh, which is a really um, hands-on and user-friendly um, uh, toolkit. So I think it's really important here to acknowledge the role, the key role that EU has played uh, in all these projects. And I think we can really talk about a, gold, a golden age of the EU urban agenda, which to me started in 1988. And I think, I'm not sure whether it's, it's over, uh, but there's certain, you know, the, the EU was crucial to, to push this regeneration project. And they set up an incredible, and the European Commission set up an incredible policy framework, which was very effective. Most of the project you, uh, you've seen, I've uh, just um, briefly introduced you here. Uh, we have received a lot of EU funding. Uh, and the objectives, you know, the, the framework included clear objectives, uh, cohesion convergence, guiding principle, complementarity, and subsidiarity. The, the, the actual the, the, the instruments were the, the structural funds, objective one and two in urban areas. But I think it was key that uh, the requirement that the EU asked for from local authorities, uh, in other words, the funding was conditional to the fulfillment of the partnership criteria. In other words, we can give you the money if you if you set up a partnership, but also if you promote an integrated approach. And this was this was through most of the cases. And you know, this is um, clearly reflected in <clears throat> in urban projects like Urban One and Urban Two. So another key element of uh, the equation of why the cities managed to uh, pull themselves out of the crisis and also regenerate uh, some of the neighbourhood is the leadership that in the early 1990s Europe experienced an incredible wave of new mayors, powerful mayors which um, provided a strong leadership for these cities and for their redevelopment. And I can think uh, of Pascal Maragall in Barcelona, for example, or Valentino Castellani in Turin. Um, and this is, you know, these are, were part of, you know, the, we are, we're all familiar to, with the, the political and economic cycles of cities, um, um, which again, I think most of the regeneration projects start at the beginning of a political cycle, which in you know, roughly four to five years. There are the economic cycles, uh, 10 to 15 years. But what we, we often forget is that there are, are the two cycles, which are the social cycles and the economic cycle. And sorry, the environmental cycle. And the social cycle takes quite a long to, you know, to, uh, to start and to finish. Uh, it's much longer than the economic cycle. So it's really important to acknowledge that social change can take at least a generation to happen. If you build a school in a deprived neighborhood, you won't see the results of this school until you know, the current pupils will, will finish the, the school and go on to the job market and increase opportunities. So I think it's important to bear in mind um, all the existence of these cycles. And so if we continue to use the metaphor of cycles, my question here and what I really would like to discuss with you this evening is, are we at the end of a cycle um, of the EU urban agenda? I've just described here how the cities for 20 years, since roughly 1990s until 2008, uh, managed to literally uh, invest a lot of in infrastructure, new renewal of neighborhood, uh, and so on and, and so forth. So my question, uh, you know, I'm, we're actually debating within LSC with um, uh, with, with Dan uh, in case with Philip Rode and, and LSC cities, uh, is how can we continue <coughs> to fund these large schemes, um, which you know, which which were an integral part of this regeneration project across Europe for the last 20 years. Um, the other question is, 
when, where, where is this funding coming from? And, and, and I invited Brian Field here to see whether the EU, European Investment Bank may, might have some answers in terms of providing some new instruments, financial instruments. Um, also, you know, another question is to understand whether the promotion of smaller scale social projects are probably more effective. And this, this is clearly the debate that think big versus think small. Now can we do more with less resources? I think this is the challenges that all the cities are facing uh, now. And at, in a much more fundamental level, I think if we are at the, end of a cycle, at, at the end of a cycle, we need to start debating whether we need the restructuring of institutions within the EU that deals with the urban dimension. We know that the funding is now is, you know, slightly over. Um, and also, we, you know, we need to change the modus operandi. We're seeing this in, in the UK, for example. You know, there, there's been a massive uh, you know, institutional restructuring with you know, the, the disappearance of local development agencies. And I wonder whether you know, at the EU level, we, we may need to start addressing some of these issues. I mean, let alone all the debate with the euro. But uh, um, and in terms of urban, we need to, understand, you know, to discuss whether we need new institutions, more you know, focused, you know, which are aware of the less resources, for example. And um, also another issue we need to uh, understand is whether the funding instruments after uh, 2013 are going to change. Uh, more specifically, some people are arguing that the grant schemes may be more or less over, uh, and there's a shift toward loans. Um, and also to the establishments of urban development funds, or I think now the new buzzword is impact uh, funds. Um, so um, I think these are questions that we really need to start addressing, uh, the funding, where it's coming from. And also, you know, in the current climate, um, the government is asking for a private sector to be more proactive, to basically uh, fill the gap that is, is being created by the, the shrinking role of the state. And I think we need to really encourage um, the, the, the private sector um, to, be, to promote more socially responsible investment policies. I mean, this is crucial. I mean, if, if they're going to play an increasing role in our economy, in our economic system and social systems, I think, um, uh, I think that social responsible investment is, is key for, for the future. Um, lastly, I think we really, need, we, we really need to acknowledge the increasing role of the philanthropic sector. I'm not sure. I'm not suggesting we switch towards an American model where the, um, the, the philanthropic sector work together with uh, local communities. But I think um, we're doing work in Bilbao with them, for example, with, uh, and we, we're discovering that the, 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 the cooperative, uh, the Mondragon Cooperative, has a massive impact on the local economy. And this is. is, is it's not market-based uh, enterprises, but it's more so social-oriented um, enterprise. And I think these these elements can provide some some answers for the future. And I think I've um, finished with that. Thank you very much. So, Tim, I'll hand straight over to you. Remember the questions, and remember your questions uh, for when we get to. The discussion time. <clears throat> yeah, I'll try and um, keep this brief because um, we do want to encourage questions this evening. And really, just to start this evening by saying many thanks indeed to the European Investment Bank for funding us to do this work. Um, we really enjoyed doing it. Um, and I also wanted to thank Andrea for being a first class researcher and for doing all the donkey work, if that's the right expression, in uh, interviewing people um, throughout these cities in Europe. But um, I, th I guess one of the key reasons for, for writing the book in the first case, in the first place, was because we saw a real gap um, that needed to be addressed. So for us, social sustainability is just one part of a four-legged stool, if you like. A four-legged stool, yes, because governance structures are really important and it's the way that those underpin the scale issue from building through to uh, cities through to international level that's so important. And maybe in all this there's been a kind of anodization, if you like, or um, a depoliticization of the term socially. 
we tend these days to talk about responsibility, whereas five or so years ago we were talking about corporate social responsibility. We talk about responsible investment, whereas we used to talk about socially responsible investment. And maybe there are semantic issues, particularly through the work of Peter Kinder, about this idea of society and socially. Does socially kind of mean that there's a balancing act between the importance of the individual and the importance of society? Which of those two sides of the coin are more important? And maybe that's part of the reason for why almost in an effort to create a level playing field in sustainability, very often the S word has dropped out of our vocabulary. So that's something I think that we felt that needed to be addressed. And of course, when we wrote the book, we were just emerging from a very difficult economic period. Um, the recession had hit property values very hard. Finance and liquidity was tight. Cities were battling their way out of recession. And of course, we've now got a very different political landscape um, as a result of political changes in the UK. And it almost reminds me of a neo-Darwinism experiment in many ways. Which of these battles are going to win through? Because we've got a localism agenda, we have a big society agenda, or is it a good society agenda? And we've got issues over growth and trying to balance and counterbalance that with sustainability. And of course the idea of community is still very much up there in the political debate that's going on. So I just wanted in the few minutes that I've got to draw out three themes that I think are really important that we tried to focus on in the book. And those themes are community, firstly. Secondly, partnership. And thirdly, the idea of metrics, vis-a-vis -vis how to measure health, well-being and happiness, which again is something of an issue at a national scale. There are two quotes on, on this slide, and I think at LSE a couple of weeks ago there was a debate, was there not, about um, the big society. How many people think that Ed Miliband said this on the left? Above all, we must build a bigger, stronger society because in the end, the things that make up that kind of society, strong families, strong communities, strong relationships, these are the things that make life worth living. How many people think that Ed Miliband may have been responsible for saying that? Just one person? Two, three, four? Not many. How many people think David Cameron said that? Well, it's kind of a, a few more. You're absolutely right. I thought the colourings might have thrown people <laughs> out there. But in fact, if you read, you read the quote on the right, which actually is what Ed Miliband said, the third task is to understand what really matters to people. It starts from what we see in our country, a sense of people being buffeted by storm winds blowing through their lives, a fear of being overpowered by commercial and bureaucratic forces beyond our control, and a yearning for the institution and relationships we cherish the most to be respected and protected. When you compare the two quotes, they're kind of saying a little bit of the same thing. So we've got this debate about big society and good society, and we've got this debate about commutarianism, in other words, how community plays out within this idea of a society, be that big or be that good. And I guess in a good society, equality becomes even more important. But um, this kind of thinking about communities is not really anything new, is it? I mean, if you're familiar with the thinking of Patrick Geddes going back to the 19th century, then in those days he was talking about the idea of places, work and folk. And this idea about giving people places in which they can really flourish. And I, I really like this quote because it's comparing people with flowers. Um, Geddes was a real um, ecologist in many ways and, and I kind of think that there's really an important um, theme and strand and narrative that takes us where we are today and can link us back to some of the thinking that was going on more than 100 years ago. So I think 
There's nothing new under the sun, is there? And we had the Egan report in 2004, and John Prescott, uh, good old John Prescott, who did a lot of really important work, I think, in, in kind of driving this idea of sustainable communities forward. And these ideas about well-run communities, well-connected communities, well-served communities, the really important things that go to make up um, a thriving and vibrant community became part of the Bristol Accord, and we talk a lot about that in the book. So the idea of community, I think, is paramount, and it's becoming even more important in the political debates that we're having at the moment. But the idea of partnership, as Andrea was saying, is also really important, and we tackle this issue of integrated sustainable urban development, which is at the heart of some of the new funding vehicles that are coming through and which Brian will be talking about in a moment. But the idea of uh, um, bringing the economic, the social and the environmental well-being of people together within the concept of um, a plan which stretches across the city and which links everything together, I think is really important. And of course the partnerships, the public and private partnerships that underpin that will also be important. And the third theme I just wanted to highlight, and again, is something that we tackle in the book, and it's where I'm going to refer to Igloo, and I, I can see Nick, uh, Nick Epps at the back there, so welcome to Nick this evening. Um, this idea of mental health and well-being, I think, is, is vital. It's, it's a very difficult subject area, isn't it, to pin down, because it's, a lot of these things are difficult to measure. And what we want to be able to do, I think, ultimately, is to provide a framework within a project at whatever scale so that we can assess the social sustainability before the project starts and then again after. So we want to be able to monitor upstream and downstream. And very few developers are into the idea of assessing mental well-being and happiness. There was some interesting work recently from the Mental Well-Being Impact Assessment Study, which is, has just come out, which was talking about four basic components of mental well-being and health. Firstly, this idea of control. In other words, that people wanted to be in control of their lives and to have some say in the way that their community was working. And that kind of links with the idea of participation, because community participation engagement is also really important, as, as Andrea was referring to. But the idea that um, we can adapt to shocks in the system, so that if you live in a community and things get difficult, then being able to tap into um, social links and social um, foundations that provide you with support <coughs> are going to be really important as well. But also producing social inclusion and promoting social inclusion is another very important area of mental health and well-being. And um, for those of you that are interested, then Igloo Footprint, we felt, were, was one of the uh, best frameworks <coughs> in terms of assessing the dimensions of social sustainability for regeneration projects, and we talk a lot about that in the book. And one of the dimensions, aside from regeneration, environmental and urban design, is this idea of health, well-being and happiness. And you can see some of the ways in which these would be assessed. So supporting healthy living, for example, building healthy communities, making sure that people have um, fresh food that's locally sourced and locally grown food, access to leisure routes and recreation spaces, creating opportunities for communities through uh, communal spaces and virtual spaci spaces as well as having social contracts in place for residents. And then finally, the ability to actually change people's lives so that the regeneration project does really make a difference and does have an impact. Of course, the trick is how do you measure this? And um, so some research that we're working on with Oxford Brooks at the moment is looking at some of the data sets that can be used to measure a number of these different dimensions. So it's taking the work that we did in EIB a stage further. 
So as far as the future was concerned, we were really saying that looking to the future, and this is kind of covering some of the issues that Andrea was, was talking about, how do we develop strategies within cities that promote differentiation? The Leipzig model of a socially integrative city was a really good example of that. So how can cities differentiate themselves moving forward based on their unique assets? How can we develop resilient communities through better local support for food, energy and banking as we move out of the recession and cities cover, recover? Can we develop innovative financing techniques that bring together this idea of green growth and low carbon and smart cities and are those appropriate narratives that we should be using? Do they provide socially inclusive outcomes? And then finally, um, new partnerships, does there need to be a rebalancing between the public and the private sectors? And of course, all this within an environment currently where we have to do, to use a famous phrase, more for less or more with less. So thank you very much for listening. And I think my time is probably up. It's certainly yep. is, yep. Thank so you thank very you. much. You've stuck over the here. Brian Field from the European Labour. Can you snuck out quickly uh, from the European Investment Bank the to please give us your perspective? It'll be the first time that some of us have heard what the European Investment, Investment Bank, Bank thinks about this soft stuff. Oh, right. So, um, so I was correct then. I assume that that knowledge of what we do and what our role is would be somewhat limited. Can yeah. I start with an apology? I've been on an aeroplane almost every day for the last two weeks and my ears haven't popped properly. So I'm not quite sure if I'm shouting or whispering. You're can doing can fine. everyone hear me? You're doing fine. Good. And when you ask questions, um, I might not hear you the first time. So if I say, would you repeat that? It's, uh, it's because I'm going deaf. Anyway, here I am, the evil banker. Um, I'm just going to provide you with some context. I'm not going to take a position. Um, I'm just going to give you some background so that this can inform the debate when we discuss the topic afterwards, when everyone has finished making their presentations, because I think it's important to have uh, an informed context before you start uh, um, diving in and asking questions. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Andrea and Tim for an excellent piece of research. We were very keen um, to fund this piece of work at the bank because the emerging EU agenda, the, the, the urban dimension, is becoming very, very important. Um, Andrea asked the question, is this the end of the, the, the era, as it were? Um, I actually think it's the start. I actually think it's the end of an era, but the start of the era where the role of cities is going to become absolutely fundamental in the way that we deliver a whole range of issues that now are becoming absolutely pivotal if we're to survive as a society. I mean, I just have to use the term climate change. And all of the, um, the EU objectives in its 2020 agenda can only be achieved um, realistically through a considered um, urban strategy. So urban is, is very important. Um, so here we go with context, and I, I, I might look like an evil banker, and I might talk like an evil banker, but I was previously an academic, so, you know, I'm a, a reasonable person uh, sometimes. <laughs> but I pressed the wrong buttons anyway. Um, right, so by way of context, the European Investment Bank, we are the lending arm of the European Union. We were created as part of the treaty. Um, we're a bank. We lend money. We expect to get it back back. Um, really, when it comes to international financial institutions, at the one extreme you have development banks like the World Bank, you know, they do good works, they do give soft loans and what have you, and at the other extreme of banking, you have commercial banks like Goldman Sachs and what's and what have you, investment banks that are just interested in profit maximisation. We're somewhere in the middle, we're a policy bank, our president likes to refer to us as a policy bank, so we're driven by policy, we're driven 
by the policy objectives of the European Union. We lend money according to those policy objectives, but we expect to be repaid, so we don't give it away. We're not, we're not in, the, in the soft loan market, in the grant market of the European Investment Bank, although we're increasingly involving ourselves in areas of activity that historically we never got involved in. Um, in 2010, we did about 71.8 billion in terms of lending volume. That was our lending volume then. The previous year it was 79.1. The, the number jumped quite dramatically in 2009 following the crisis. We were part of the rescue package. Historic, you know, in the last decade, our average has been about 55, six, 55 to 60 billion in terms of volume. Now, what does that mean? I mean, I, I've got no idea what 60 billion is. I, you know, I, I can't cope with monopoly, never mind uh, money, of, <coughs> money at that scale. But um, to give you an idea, in terms of lending volume, that makes us about, in, in any one year, we do about two to three times um, what the World Bank does. If you took all the IFIs <coughs> in the world, put them all together, European Investment Bank, EBRD, um, Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, Black Sea Development Bank, Council of, um, Council of Europe Development Bank, yeah, there's a nice one, um, Inter-American Development Bank, add them all together, that's about the volume of what the European Investment Bank does. So we're very big, and we've also historically been relatively anonymous, and yet, yet we're your bank, you know. We're delivering money, and we're delivering projects, infrastructure projects, across Europe, which are trying to address disparities between the rich and poor regions of, of this continent in which we live. So we're quite important. I hope I haven't exaggerated, but, um, but there we go. Our shareholders are the 27 member states of the EU, like I said, we're the lending arm of the EU, but we're not functionaires. I'm not a, a, a European civil servant. I, the, the bank has to make its own money. The bank pays for itself. The bank raises its money on capital markets like any other bank, and then it passes on the benefits of its AAA rating, because we can raise money very cheaply. It passes on its benefits of AAA rating to the people that we lend the money to. And uh, we have to earn enough every year to pay our salaries, and, and our bonuses, or an important word in banking terms, bonuses. Um, but we, we don't get bonuses in the same way that commercial bankers do. You know, I mean, we don't drive around in flash cars and nip out and buy a new Porsche every year with our bonuses. You know, we might decide on a on an extra week's holiday or something because um, our bonuses are relatively modest. Not a lot different from uh, a thirteenth month in, in Europe. There is a, a tradition in the public sector of getting a thirteenth month salary. So that's by way of contact. That's the bank. Still pressing the wrong buttons. As far as urban is concerned, the EU has, is driven by what it calls the subsidiarity principle. Sorry, I struggle to say it. And the reason I struggle to say it is actually a word that doesn't exist in the English language. But as academics and as bureaucrats, we're great at making up words um, to describe things that we, we want to describe rather than using those words that, are already, that already exist. Now, the subsidiarity principle says that the administration in any area of public administration or intervention should take place at the lowest possible level of administration. In other words, um, the person intervening should be as close as possible to the beneficiary. Um, and urban, historically, um, was something that the EU felt should be left to member states to get on with themselves. Um, the EU was involved the, since 1988, as you said, there was, a, the, there was a growing EU intervention with a whole range of experiments and what have you, but these were essentially um, modest interventions, maybe not as modest as, as you think, but when you look at the volumes of money that we deal in with the bank. For the bank, you know, we, we didn't do a lot in the urban sector. But what started to happen was policymakers started to see that there was a commonality in the sorts of problems that urban areas were experiencing. You know, the problems of Paris were not very different from the problems of London and, and the, the sorts of riots that we got in Bristol we would see um, sometimes in Rome. And perhaps if there was a commonality in the problems, there was a commonality in the solutions, and if there was a, a possible common solution, um, certainly when it came to investment, perhaps the EU should get involved in the, the the EU has incrementally got involved and involved more and more 
in the urban agenda, and the Bristol Accord was really um, uh, quite an important uh, point because at that point the EU formally got involved um, in a big way and it launched uh, the Jessica Initiative. Jessica stands for Joint European Support for Sustainable Investment in City Areas. I had to think about it just for a second, although I was the very first Jessica coordinator at the bank, I was the first person that they appointed to look after Jessica. Um, I've since moved, moved on. Now, once the EU got involved, the EU was driven by the idea, and this is, this is fundamental, in the Bristol Accord, the Bristol Accord doesn't talk about the urban agenda, it talks about the need to create more sustainable communities. And we've since added a word to that, we've said the need to create more sustainable cities and communities. Sustainability is fundamental. And sustainability, whoops, I'm pressing the wrong button. Sustainability is driven, as academics, we tend to think in terms of the need to have an integrated approach to intervention and to investment if we're to promote more sustainable solutions. There's no point in doing ad hoc projects and just looking at the projects in isolation and endeavouring to, to quantify the benefit of that project if a handful of people um, benefit and yet the consequences of the project are suffering somewhere else. Externalities, I mean, that's all you talk about in your economics lectures, isn't it? You know, that's what I used to talk about anyway in my economics lectures. So, sustainability is important, integration is important. And in response to that, the bank has developed a number of financial instruments. I'm getting, and um, just want to finish with this slide. You can have a look at my other slides later. The bank has responded with what I call an implicit action for cities. I called it an implicit action for cities because if you look at our annual report, you won't find a thing called uh, the action for cities. But this implicit action for cities has four dimensions. One, we're increasingly involving ourselves in giving technical assistance, helping promoters, helping cities, helping disadvantaged regions to develop projects which they will then borrow money to implement, which will help them. But they don't have the wherewithal to develop the projects initially. So we <laughs> provide them with free money. So we're doing more technical assistance, something that historically we never did a lot of. We've increased our traditional lending in the urban sector. Instead of just doing bridges and roads and things all the time now, we're looking at complex integrated urban regeneration projects and we're lending more in the urban sector and about 10% of our lending volume now goes on urban projects. We're involving ourselves in financial engineering. We're promoting the use of financial engineering methodologies through instruments like Jessica to do more with less. And I'll explain what that means in questions later because I don't want to take up other people's time. And the final thing is, we're increasingly involved in ourselves in structured finance. Historically, we are a very conservative institution. We lent money to people who we knew had the wherewithal to pay us back. We never took a punt. But what we do now is, we're increasingly ma making equity investments. We're increase increasingly taking risk. Now, this was something that was growing for a number of years throughout, you know, since about 2000. Unfortunately, the, the crash and the, the need to be a little bit more prudent has, has put a sort of stop to this, to this agenda. But I, I can see, once again, the, the, the structured finance thing growing in the future. And I think for urban areas, there is a, a doing more with less solution that I think that is available, which um, I, I'll perhaps put to you during questions. Um, I'm hoping that it's something that might be suggested by the next speaker. I haven't not, I'm not got time to talk about all those. For those of you that want to get in touch with me to ask me any questions, at the end of the presentation, there's my business card. Okay, thank you. Thank you. very, very enlightening. So, over to the political perspective on Europe. Yes, when Brian introduced himself as uh, 
hello banker, what can the politician say? Uh, 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 I, I'm the member of the Green Parliament from Poland, and I am a, a president of the uh, chairman of the uh, so-called Urban Intergroup. This is a special group which is cross-party, cross-committee, especially people working on one subject, which is urban. Um, uh, not by chance, most of the members of, of this intergroup are the former mayors or the former councillors, etc. Me, myself, when I left the university, when I, when I was teaching sociology, uh, I became the mayor of the city, which is half Polish, half Czech, and next the president of the region, so that's my interest in the urban problems. Just uh, to react for the, uh, uh, for the first statements, uh, I absolutely share the view that the uh, global age of uh, urban uh, 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 it was in the uh, beginning of 2000, 2001, it was over, absolutely. And I would like to explain in a short uh, uh, word, say, uh, why. The problem of European money is, uh, is mixed with the problem of, the, uh, of pol with politics. And we shouldn't forget it that, uh, for example, when we discuss about so-called so regional policy, or later about urban policy, we are discussing from one point of view about money, investment, growth, but at the same time this is ongoing process concerning the uh, problem of uh, competences, of power, and, uh, and the, uh, and the uh, relation between different kinds of power. Regional policy is uh, investing the money on the so-called regional level. Uh, but at the same time, we observe the process of regionalization, which is creating the regional structures, administration, etc., etc. So these two processes can overlap, and we can have the effect that the European money can reinforce the political process. Uh, that's why in many countries, the, the, the politicians, they say the European Union wants from us the regional structure. Uh, very interesting example, I mean, in England comparing to Wales and to Scotland, I mean, in terms of uh, regions we've elected and not quangos. By the way, Hungarians, so they, they were discussing their regional structure and say quangos in England is beautiful uh, <laughs> uh, because it's not political, not elected, it, it, it exists, it doesn't exist, it depends on what you want from it. it uh, <coughs> it's, it's regional in a way. So. We shouldn't forget when we were discussed about money. The, the import, I mean, the important element is power and the role of the uh, authorities. That, that's why in many <coughs> papers, books, etc., about European cities, you can see that the, the author, when they say cities act, what it means cities act? It means local authorities act. We, when we discuss the process which are in a human set settings like Lang City, we are discussing probably immigration, social exclusion, etc. But we, when we in, in speak about the action of the city, it means the, the competences of the city in the concrete system. That's, that's why, not by chance, the regional policy from several times uh, 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 was prepared to introduce the element of urban. But each time it was blocked. It was blocked by the member states because of subsidiarity principle. It's beautiful. I mean, subsidiarity principle, as you know, is coming from the social teaching of the, of the church. It's about the relation about the individual and the family, which, which is, for, for the believer, is natural relation. But the rest is just the agreement. It's nothing natural in subsidiarity principle. It's just, let's decide. What are the competences of local and regional, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But we can use subsidiarity as a mechanism to block something and say, "Don't touch it. It's this is up to national." Or, "Don't touch it. It's on the local local level." Uh, there, is, what is it? What's inside? Each time there is the fight. You can observe committee of the regions when it's the fight between the regional authorities and the local authorities, because the mayors of capital cities of the regions are stronger than the president of the regions. This is, that's why this is continuing battle. And that's why the, uh, uh, the, in each time when it was the, the, the tendency to introduce the urban, it was stopped and no, regional. Regional policy, when you go into details, is not about the regional authorities, but it's about the natural, it's about the nomenclature units for territorial statistics, so-called NATS 2, NATS 3, etc. So subsidiarity plays a very important role. It will played a very important role, it's still playing a very important role. It was a tendency. I mean, someone was once wanted to introduce it into regional policy. It was blocked. So that's why Commission, 
they, they discovered that maybe they, made it, they can make it through the experiment. What you, what you said, it's experiment. They, they're trying to pilot project urban, next urban one, urban two. Very interesting European community initiatives, but very limited, very, very modest, what, what Brian said. But in fact, giving first commission the possibility to introduce something new, to experiment the method, to use the integrated approach in practice, to introduce the partnership with the citizens in practice, to make something which is theoretically completely impossible. This is the mixing different funds, which is impossible for the larger scale, but it was possible on a smaller scale. So that's why the urban project was so interesting, because it, they introduced the participants of the people, but they proposed a different new methodology. But it was over. It was mainstreamed in 2003, 4, and 5, and from 2007, everything is mainstreamed. I do remember, I was, it was my first ter term in the European Parliament, we came from the practice, uh, uh, from being the mayors, etc. And we said, listen, mainstreaming the urban methodology is a catastrophe, because the member states will not be interested in using this methodology in this kind of project, because they, once they have the money in their national budget, they will find another important element. So this mainstreaming will be just symbolic, uh, putting something, I mean, to the water and it will disappear. And this was the reality. There are very, very few elements of the uh, urban methodology now in the, in the European member states. What we proposed at that time was, for example, to, to make the possibility for the member states, or make it, no, possibility, make, make it mandatory, to prepare the system to give the cities man, possibility of managing the funds, not project by project, but managing the funds for seven years. I mean, to create the bigger project for the quarter for, for the city, etc. So it was refused. Why? Because of subsidiarity. One year later, it was the, the debate about the transport and the urban mobility. It was blocked. Who, by whom? By German lenders. Because don't touch it. It's up to the cities. This is their problem. When you introduce something, you are breaking the subsidiarity principle. But at the same time, you are discussing the rural development. Rural development is okay. I mean, it's a part of the common agriculture policy. So working on rural development is correct. Working on urban is breaking subsidiarity. It's completely illogic. It's something behind. But I think that what we can observe now is growing important. Why? Because the, the biggest challenges today in Europe are in the cities. We can like it or not, but it is in the cities. We are now preparing the new regulations, and we would like to introduce the, the urban dimension into the regulation, it will be a very interesting debate in the coming months. But of course, in the last remark, which is very important, we were trying to persuade the Commission that we cannot discuss the technical problems which are in the cities. We have to discuss the model of the city. We have to discuss the European model of the city. What we want from, from the development of the city. What kind of model we would like to have in Europe in 20, 50 years. What about the urban sprawl? What about the transport in the city? What about the energy efficiency, etc., etc.? Do we have the idea what we really want in Europe? We need a very serious debate. That's why the European Commission is now is finishing the paper uh, Cities of Tomorrow. So, but if we want to use European money, we, we need to have a model. Because this is policy, it's not distributing, it's not charity. It's making policy. It means we have this kind of priority because we need this kind of elements in the cities. We can give you the European money if you fulfill the requirements, if you go this way. One example, then I will finish, urban sprawl. What, there are many analyses which show that uh, many, in many cities in Europe, urban sprawl, among the others, was caused and uh, it was provoked by European money. The possibility of spending European money, a very easy way of spending European money, was to creating more and more infrastructure. In fact, it provoked urban sprawl. So we, we, we have to be aware of this, and that's why we should use European policy and European money as the instrument for policy making and not for the charity to, to achieve the goals we would like to, to well define. So that's why the new golden age of urban policy is coming. And not because they like it or not, but this is the challenge we are facing. We are quite optimistic 
uh, about this because urban is about practice, very pragmatic, not the European blah blah. So, sorry, I don't have any presentation, but beware of politicians with PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> I found those presentations absolutely fascinating. I'm going to suggest the panel should stay where they are because we're incredibly short of time, thanks to your eloquence between you. Um, so can I just invite people from the audience to make comments, to ask questions? Please, please, one, say who you are and where you're from, but two, be very brief so we can get lots of points. And I'd like to collect up some points and then pounce on the panel. Yes? Hello, I'm uh, Mark Basket, a property monger from... Did you say a property monger? Monger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the EBRD. Um, I've got a question, two questions, if you'll allow me. The first is for you. Uh, so Andrea. Yeah. Um, to what extent do you think that the social... Uh, result measurement methods that you mentioned so shy and then and also people who to what extent do you think they've contributed towards increasing the importance of, of social arguments and regeneration? That's my first question. And then for uh, Mr Field, um, who exactly are you lending to? Who what sorry? Who exactly are you lending to? Okay. More questions? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Michael McCroft. I'm from the Young Foundation, which is a Centre for Social Innovation. Um, we're also looking at questions of social sustainability, um, in particular in new communities, rural and urban, um, in the UK. Um, and we think this work is fantastic, because it helps us to address lots of issues we're dealing with. But a key, a key question for us is, how much does it cost to invest in, in a social sustainability framework at the beginning um, of the new development? So, um, in the places you were talking about where you were just at the brand for the state, what's the upfront investment and have you done any cost benefit analysis to see um, you know, how that plays out over time and who inherits the benefit? Well, we might ask Igloo to mm. come back on that one because yeah. they're experts, they spend their precious money on it. Um, Philip. Philip, uh, Rodi from LSE City, CF London School of Economics. Um, Andrea, a question for you, and very much inspired by your overview of how sustainability and the sort of tripartite have emerged over time. And, and I really wonder to which extent we actually need to continue addressing the bubbles themselves uh, instead of what's happening in between them. I can just refer to what we have seen, of course, with this relationship between the environmental and the economic. It's obviously that the two sort of become bigger at the moment because they're discussed as being connected. So the costing <coughs> off, and the same question we just heard, the costing off your social agenda. So my question for you is whether you actually looked at uh, the synergetic effects, but also the contradictions and frictions between social and environmental sustainability. Okay. Yes. Um, Mark Atkinson, I'm a development officer with the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, I'm interested in the idea of new economic strategies which promote differentiation. Um, what do you mean by differentiation? Well, that was my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and differentiation between cities. Oh, right, okay. My understanding of the yeah, yeah. meaning. But also what about within cities uh, in a place where people are very sensitive about the idea that one high street is becoming very similar to another. Okay. Yes. Would you mind standing up? It's just people will hear you better. <laughs> Jim, thank you for coming. Okay, so how show maybe the social return on investment? Other questions? Okay, well we've got about eight questions and I want to ask um, an extra question of our politician at the very end. 
So, um, Andrea, there are several questions to you. Could you give us very, very quick, short, sharp, sharp answers? We've only got a few minutes left. The, 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 the metrics, the, mo the monitoring system which I've shown, uh, like the social index, um, are very effective to a certain extent. And the problem is that they're very expensive to maintain and reproduce. And because what they're doing is to use questionnaire survey to monitor, to assess these intangible issues of social connections or uh, cap capabilities. And it's a very business. It's a very expensive business to, to do it on a yearly basis. So, um, but I think this was really prompted by the local municipality when the new the new mayor of Rotterdam really pushed for for new for a, for a tool that could inform you to uh, what to to act, um, what kind of dimension or what kind of um, policy policy domain, uh, social policy domain you should be, um, you should act. So I think they, you know, they're very effective, but they're very um, expensive. And I think here, um, for, from a um, uh, private sector perspective, you know, a lot of commitment. And I think the clue, once again, is that, that one of the few guys who are literally bringing the social dimension, the social assessment of impact uh, before they, their project starts. I think they're probably better place than me to answer what's the cost of, of this. Of, um, of um, you know, maintaining this, this sort of metrics. And I think related to this, um, I think it's important to answer your question that um, to include the social issues as, as soon as possible when you start uh, making plans. But at the moment, um, I feel like local authorities don't have the money to to do it. So they just do what they can with the, you know, the limited financial resources they have. So. They, they don't even have a budget allocated to the inclusion of this sort of uh, pre, you know, um, ex ante assessment method. And I think that that's the real barrier. We had a workshop uh, with that on transport, and I was saying the same things um, that you, know, you need to incorporate before you start a bridge or a new train. You need to start the social impact assessment of this project. And there was a lady from the Birmingham Transport Administration say, "Yes, we would love to do it, but we don't have the money, nor the personnel, nor the capacity. So it's you know it's, it's an institutional problem." Could, can I just add yes, a, a, do, quick, a quick point? Because um, I think we've been in email c contact with the, with the Young Foundation, but um, Chatham House rules prevent me from saying who, who the, we're, we're working with currently. But there are data sets available that enable us to track social sustainability over time and those data sets are becoming much more readily available. Survey work, yes, that's a cost, but you know, in order to get um, a viable outcome and to have a really vibrant community, I think that's a price that's worth paying. So Brian, can I ask you to just make a quick comment on this, how you show a return on investment and how you actually do it all through loans, given that there are three. There are three linked questions which address this question: who, who, who do we lend to? We're global. Although we're the European Investment Bank, we're global. Eighty percent plus of our lending volume goes to European Union um, countries. Five percent plus goes to the rest of Europe, non-EU, and maybe something of the order of five percent to the rest of the world. So it looks as though we don't do a lot outside of the EU. But remember, these other five percent are five percent of a very, very big number. Yeah. So in Africa, we we'll operate at the same sort of level as the African Development Bank. In Asia, the same sort of level as the Asian Development Bank, and so on. And for projects, we lend to. Um, when it comes to, you know, we're, we're concerned about the projects rather than the, the the promoter. So if it's a good quality project that delivers something that is in accord with European policy objectives, then that project. It, it is a project that will be supported. So it's the eligibility of the project that is crucial, um, and of course the capacity of whoever the promoter is, the borrower, to repay us. You know, we're not going to, you know, we, 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 we don't take a punt. We're, we're similar sort of criteria to the ones that you'll use at EBRD, except for, obviously we have a much wider constituency. Um, on the return, when we're invested, when we're looking at projects, we you know, we're, even if someone says that we're going to pay you back because it's heavily subsidised, even if they say it's heavily subsidised, we still want to make sure <laughs> that project 
is a worthwhile project in, in the European policy context. So what we do is we look for a financial um, a, 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 a pro project that has a positive financial rate of return. But if it doesn't, then we're willing to extend the analysis and to do the cost-benefit analysis and to see what positive externalities are generated by the project to give it a, a positive rate of return. And we, we, we normally we will normally support anything where we can get a, a rate of return in excess of 7%, economic rate of return, not financial rate of return. Okay, so, and if, if we're outside of Europe in a, in a developing country, we probably want to look at above 12%. But please don't quote me on these, on these numbers, but these are the sort of ballparks that I work with on the projects that I'm working on. Okay, but that all means that at the end of the day, social investment has to be funded from within yeah, but the point is... From within maybe the overall we, project, but... Yeah, it's got to be funded with... You can, you can you have internal cross-subsidies within a project to ensure that the social investment component is, is, is there. But our concern is that the economic rate of return is sufficient to justify the investment. Yeah. Because normally there'll be someone who'll be willing to... Yeah. And there is the capacity to blend loans with, with, with grants and things to bring down the real cost of the loan. So other institutions will often say, well, you know, we will give you a grant if you can get an EIB loan to go with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Tim, I wondered if you wanted to comment on this uh, tripartite bubbles, um, you know, you're Mr. Sustainable Development <laughs> in Oxford Brooks, Professor Sustainable Development. In Oxford Brooks. Professor of real estate, actually. Well, I know, but you are director. <laughs> of sustainable so, development. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you'd have said with, so with mainly, a wouldn't you? Interest in sustainable development. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think the short answer is we didn't sort of examine the trade-off, but there is clearly uh, the potential for a kind of um, counterbalance between growth and, and the green agenda, and it's. It's how we <clears throat> actually end up in terms of thinking of future trajectories. I think somebody was mentioning about futures thinking, and I think scenarios and future-based studies can help us to examine how that trade-off might be made. You know, if you imagine a, a quadrant where you have um, growth along a vertical axis and production and consumption along the, the horizontal axis, then you can start to populate that with scenarios which might enable you to move to a more sustainable future. But inevitably, there's a trade-off, and this becomes a political argument which is being played out even as we speak. Well, you said it perfectly. That brings me to my question, and you have to give us a very short answer. You said you were yes, expert no, yes. at short answers. Um, <laughs> You talked about the golden age of cities was about to come, and you talked about how bad the EU had been in fostering sprawl, and I have been the personal witness of it in most of the peripheral countries, at least, where vast roads going nowhere have been built, and then houses have been plonked along them, and then at the very end of them. Um, so the converse of that is sustainable cities. Are you sure that's going to happen? Is Poland doing well at that? No, Why did you knife the it, recent it, EU talks on sustainability and climate change? Okay. Uh, the reality is much more complex, so that's why we need this kind of uh, policy, because it, it doesn't work like this. So, but the, the, let me just make one, one remark, because the, very often we can see the, uh, the terminology which has which uh, uh, been present in the uh, scientific I mean, researchers for, for a long time, and now are the interest into politics. And I, I, I would just give you one, one example, it's very important for the debate about the, uh, this book. Uh, when you read very carefully Strategy 2020, I mean, we, we love in your opinion this kind of 2020, <laughs> PS, no, etc. Et but uh, we have. Is uh, this the climate change strategy or is this the no, urban no, 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 strategy? No, no. This, I mean, the, the economic agenda. The, 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 okay, the okay. Lisbon strategy the is whole over. thing, okay. It, and this, it was not a big success because it was up to the member states to decide. So now we have new strategy, which is for the next 10 years. It's accepted by the member states. Strategy 2020, it has several goals, and it has three dimensions. And this is very interesting, the dimension. They are, first, smart growth. Second is sustainable growth. And third is inclusive growth. <coughs> sustainable growth is different than inclusive growth in the political language of today's EU. The first reaction of the budget people 
is um, we call them budget people or transport people because we are we have the we are facing sectorization, which is very very difficult for. for uh, uh, the first reaction for the budget people was to put the different policies in different dimensions. Smart means innovation, research. Sustainability means agriculture, climate change, energy. Inclusive growth means social policy. So you, you can see how it, the, the terminology is translated. But we are trying to show that all the elements should be three-dimensional. I mean, all the elements should be in each of, of them, and not two separate. But this is also the tendency to sectorize. And to sustainability, even if it's not mainly concentrated on environment, now it goes to the uh, 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 agriculture, energy, climate change, etc. But, uh, 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 but still, the, uh, uh, what we are trying to defend, going to, to your question, is to create this kind of policy which can be efficient, which can change reality, and not distributing the money and the, the next observed results, which is the case with the government's problem. Okay, I'm really, really sorry to have to tell everybody that we're out of time. Um, I think some amazing issues have arisen. Andrea asked this crucial question, are we at the end of a cycle of investment? We certainly know that the last cycle of investment has run out in the cities that we've been visiting with Andrea. Um, can smaller projects actually work to deliver results? Um, this point that you made, Brian, about um, the implicit action plan for cities, I think we need a proper, proper discussion and debate around that here at LSE, if you would agree to do it. And to come back. Yeah. And for the politics of it, I think those were wise words. And um, I'd like to thank you for contributing them. So I'd like to thank you all for coming. And I hope our speakers will hang around so that you can all get a little bit more chance to talk to them. But I'd particularly like to thank Andrea, who I hear did the lion's share of the work. And I'd like to let you all know um, that this very, very remarkable book is on sale outside, and the lady selling them absolutely does not want to take them back to Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very much, and let's give a final round of applause to our speakers.